talking about? to the world, my weekly podcast, my weekly stream, and record of the time, and alternative to the RIAA, the MPAA, the IFPI, Netflix, Gormley, and other corporate media. And this is a weekly broadcast, and today is no exception. So, what is going on in the world of Jeff today? Well, unfortunately, no guests today. So, as usual, if there's no guests, I have two songs lined up for you to hear. And this week, I've been listening to something I've been meaning to get to for a long time, and I'm kind of surprised I have never gotten to it at this point. And that is the third album that Kimiko, if I'm pronouncing this right, Ishizaka, a classically trained pianist, has released of Johann Sebastian Bach's work in the public domain or in the Creative Commons and free for everyone to share and to listen to and to enjoy, to learn from and to experience because this is part of the foundation of our musical culture as at large. And so this album is The Art of the Fugue. And there's a good couple of songs here of which I've got two lined up uh, just to give a sample of this album, which is well worth the download. It, it's even worth paying for, I would say. I am still kind of deciding how much I'm going to remunerate her for, but I've got here lined up, if I'm pronouncing this right, Canon per Augmentian, or yeah, I can't even pronounce that word, in Contrario Motu and Contrapunctus 8 uh, 3. Uh, so I'll let you enjoy these two songs, and then we'll get back to the rest of the show.
So, you can go out and listen to that whole album, The Art of the Fugue, by Kimiko Ishizaka, if I'm pronouncing that right. It's beautiful, like all her other attempts at recreating Bach in a modern world and making it so that we can all hear Bach as maybe not as originally intended, but pretty close. And that last one, I want to highlight a little bit because uh, contrapunctus, uh, what is contrapunctus? There is a Latin term, punctus contrapunctum, which from Wikipedia, quote, means point against point, note against note. And what is happening here and what is happening in Bach generally and especially in the Art of the Fugue, one of his kind of masterpieces of complex music, some of the most complex and beautiful music up until that point, is the use of counterpoint. And from Wikipedia again, quote, in music, counterpoint is the relationship between voices which are harmonically interdependent, yet independent in rhythm and contour. So in other words, there's something going on where the rhythm is detached between two ongoing themes or two ongoing parts of the music. And the rhythm starts to slide from being totally in sync to being kind of out of sync and then kind of back in sync again and so it's that playing with the having two things going on perhaps mentally that Bach is playing with in that piece and is playing with in the art of the few generally and is one of the masters of and it's one of the best examples of and if you want to understand counterpoint and never mind be able to play it but just being able to hear it being able to pick it up when it happens Bach is a good place to start and I'm just going to click on uh, Wikipedia also has a sample of counterpoint here and I'm just gonna, I haven't actually heard this one yet but hopefully it's going to display it a little bit so that we can get another sample of it so we can kind of know what we're looking for but let's take a look at this So that was a little short, kind of hard to catch on that one, maybe a little harder than I thought it was going to be. But the point here is that sometimes you can get into a, if you're creating music or hearing something that somebody else has created, there can be two things going on in terms of time. There can be two separate rhythms going on that then come into a union at a later point. And it's certainly not wrong in music to do pretty much anything. But there are these conversations, these musical conversations that can happen, where you have one voice and then another voice, and they seem to be talking about two different things, and then after a while they kind of converge on one. And that is the where I want to kind of start today's episode on. Because there's been a lot of things that have been going on over the past couple of weeks, and you can go back to the previous episodes to get a sense for those things, things like COVID-19, things like the uh, now global protests over the death of George Floyd and the corresponding police response, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there have been, over this week specifically, a lot of really heated conversations and a lot of heated political debates going on, at least in my world. And there was one in particular where, actually there was a good couple in particular, where the point was made that people should not make certain points or not uh, try to, to bring the focus away from the conversation. And that if you are taking part in these threads that you're assumed in a sense to be taking place in this conversation and that only certain perspectives are allowed to be talked about certain viewpoints are allowed to be expressed, and certain opinions perhaps are relevant. Now, in any conversation, there's going to be a selection of things that are relevant and selection that are not. Go see my red herring video. I'll link to that later on for the future if you want to get a, a sense for when things can be not appropriate. But at the same token, there is a value in having multiple conversations going on at any given time. The human race is a big collection of individuals. There are so many things going on at any one given time that it's almost hard to imagine that people could even conceive that there would only be one conversation going on at one time in the entirety of the world. And perhaps there's this level of peace. Maybe we've, we've hit this level of world peace where we're all talking about the same thing and all on the same page. And for the people perhaps who are trying to get to that point, maybe there's some value in that. But at the same time, the music that is the global conversation, the structured 
thought that everyone communicating and expressing themselves and having conversations with other people, there is a harmony of voices, a, a collection of voices that at all times is going to be beyond one conversation. Or perhaps it is my understanding that that is how things have always been and probably will be, that there will always be more voices. And the idea of counterpoint here is relevant because sometimes the arguments seem to be separate arguments, but then combine later on and the points that don't seem to be relevant can combine later on and bring themselves up to be and break into the current argument that perhaps they may not seem like they're related until you start to unravel and develop the theme and develop the voice and to work your way from what seems to be unrelated what seems to be irrelevant what seems to be grating or what seems to be in disharmony with what's being spoken and what's currently being said. Of course, not everyone has the patience to listen to and to wait for things to come together. And maybe things in some conversations will never come together. There's no real need to expect that they will. And certainly in your private conversations, in your life, there's little need to expect that your conversations will have to end at the point where other people's conversations will. In your private conversation, your communication with the people in your life, maybe you'll reach different conclusions and you'll reach different heights of understanding of issues than I will. And that's okay, I think, to expect. There's all kinds of conversations that can and are happening in the world right now. And I think it is a mistake to shut down all conversation that isn't part of the one conversation. That to say that there is one conversation that everyone has to participate in, or that everyone is participating in, I think is being a little too hopeful, perhaps, on one hand. And on the other hand, it also closes other conversations off that could happen. I've lost five friends this week, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. There's a lot of people, similar to the, the November 2016 election, that have become so politicized that they can't stand the people in their lives anymore, even if they don't even disagree with them on fundamental levels. And so there is value in remembering this idea that there are sometimes other voices and that sometimes they'll come together with you sometimes they'll come apart but it's the song of humanity's total experience the counterpoint in question there is something there to remember that that exists and we can work with that or we can ignore it and the peanut gallery is right everyone does walk their own path and it's worth remembering there is value in those other paths, being out there, being able to see things and express things that maybe your path can't express, can't see. So with that in mind, let's start with the conversation, because of course everyone is talking about this. So let's go back a little bit and listen to a little clip. Uh, somebody posted this because this conversation, the question of what is the value of police and what are police and how should we perceive them has been something that has been going on for a long time. And so this one is from Patrolling, I believe. I have the season and episode, I think, on the clip, but I'm just going to play this like little clip and kind of go from there. So this is from Sean Kennedy's Patrolling. Let's hear what one of the guests he had in Patrolling had to say back a good couple of years ago. No. Officer, ignorant, mercenary, Nazi thugs, and anyone who straps on a gun in the morning and goes to work really isn't a decent person if they're trying to support their family, making a living, ruining decent people's lives. That's awesome. That's rad. That's the fucking best. Anything else? Tell me more, tell me more why you hate cops. I look like the kind of person that would be suspicious. Right. Because I'm different. They would come and ask me questions. Right. Assume that I'm doing something wrong because of the way I look or act. Right. So that was, again, just a little clip of a much broader conversation that was going on back in, what was it, 2006, 2005, uh, something around that era. I'll, I'll look up the, the actual date later. But this is a conversation that has been going on for a long time. And this the view of cops as, quote, Nazi thugs is not a new one. And so when a lot of people, I think, uh, right now are, are coming into this, this context where people are seeing each other in these really, really charged ways. And it's easy to think, oh man, this is new. That people are just suddenly deciding that cops are these evil things or that there's this conflict that we can't see each other and, and this is new and things are getting worse and totally out of hand. And yet this video is like a, a decade old. And so there is and has been this thread that has been going on under our polite society, under this kind of expectation of being able to call 911 in an emergency, that there are people who are afraid of the police. 
there are people who have negative experiences whenever the police are involved in their lives. There are people who are treated differently by the police than perhaps other people. Uh, people who have a more positive impression of what the police are. And it is important to understand that there is this narrative, there is this story that has been with us for a long time. And the further back you go, I think the more examples like this you are going to see. But there was more to that particular conversation, that particular little debate that you just heard. And I would encourage you after this show to go listen to the whole thing because it is worth hearing in its entirety. But the important thing I think to get out of the conversation is that even once you acknowledge, even if we just take for granted that everything that was just said about these people who are, are just trying to do a job, perhaps, even if we accept it, that there is this negative aspect to them, the question becomes, how do you, the person listening to this podcast right now, how do you act in a situation where the cops get into your life? How do you, if you're at a protest and the cops come and start forming a line around the protest, what do you do? What should you do? What do you do? How do you react if you're in a situation and the cops start getting involved? And the suggestion is to basically stand down and to not allow your actions to escalate the situation. Now, there may be situations in which it is worth ignoring this advice, and it, there may be situations in which there is a broader need to stand up for what you believe in, perhaps, to be at that protest in the street, even ignoring the implications on COVID. There may be a need to do the right thing and to sacrifice your own personal safety, but think very carefully about who has the ability to escalate any situation further whenever you're getting into a situation where violence can happen. If you are not armed, then the immediate assumption is going to be that the police are going to be able to overpower you when push comes to shove. And that if you don't have a gun, then they have a gun you don't. The situation can only end in one way, which is you are going to be overpowered. And if you do have a gun, of course, the other problem is it doesn't really matter if you have a gun or not because bullets don't care who they hit, right? If you have a gun and they have a gun, and even if you get a shot off, it, again, it doesn't matter. You're still going to get some lead put into your body in places you don't necessarily want it. So it is worth thinking very, very carefully when you are in a situation where police start getting involved. Here in Canada, our police kettle. And what kettling means is they basically surround you on all four sides of maybe a city block and then start squeezing you in and pushing their lines forward on all four sides, allowing them to arrest literally everyone in a city block, whether or not you're protesting or not. Now, is this right? Is this wrong that they can just arrest you for no reason here in Canada? Well, I would argue that this is a wrong thing, but it doesn't really matter if you're in a situation where you start to notice police starting to build a kettle. Because if you know that they have a history of kettling, you should get the hell out of there as quickly as you can before you are trapped in. And if you find that you're trapped in on three sides, you really don't want to be dawdling around and waiting for them to trap you in and block off that fourth side. You really want to be polite and try not to escalate the situation in any way you can, even if you're in the right, even if you are in a position where they shouldn't be harassing you and they shouldn't be treating you differently. There's all kinds of things that they shouldn't be doing to you, perhaps, and that's fine. Uh, to be in that situation and to stand down at that time because at the end of the day they can overpower you they can do all kinds of terrible things to you here in canada legally even you can be arrested that is i've mentioned in previous videos and held basically in a revolving door situation where you are not charged with a crime not allowed to see a lawyer not allowed to speak with your family not allowed to see the red cross and they can keep you in this for the rest of your life. Now, is it possible that if you have enough people that you can overpower the police? Sure, happens all the time. I mean, not every day, but certainly there are lots of examples in history, and I've seen video of plenty of them, where if there's enough muscle on the side that isn't the police, that the police are incapable of pushing it back. However, if you are listening to this, if you as an individual are hearing this right now, I would be very cautious, even in that situation, of being willing to be in that situation. Because at that point, they are faced with a choice of escalate or not escalate. You are faced with a choice, escalate or not escalate. They can fire using their guns on the crowd. Would it be wrong for them to do so? Absolutely. Would it matter if it's wrong or right if you're the one catching that bullet? Think very carefully about that question when you go out 
protest. Now, is it worth still going out to protest even if you're risking your own life? That's a choice. Of course, that's up to you. But we can still think about our own personal safety on that level of treating the cops as if they were these Nazi thugs, as if they were dangerous and volatile and not capable of restraint and capable only of escalation. Because th there are these voices that remind us over the, the years that this is what we should expect from them, that we should not expect compassion or mercy or anything of that kind or that nature. They are, of course, human beings incapable of that. But if you look throughout the videos that have been posted this week, so many, especially in the States, so many cops have just walked by while their fellow cops have been abusing, roughing up, kidnapping, knocking people to the ground, spraying people with chemicals, spraying chemicals into the air, making it difficult to breathe. This is what the world we live in is like. This is what the people who are charged with protecting the structures of power are like. The people who do not act like this do not continue to be successful at maintaining their working relationships with their fellow cops. And so when we get to this point where we can't assume our own safety, we do have to take responsibility for our own personal safety on some level. And it's worth thinking about that. Now, while that's been going on, there was one incident in specific that I wanted to bring up. And I will have to give credit to the source that I found the original video. I don't particularly agree with their uh, interpretation of it, but they had the video. And I've been waiting for this video to come out because it really does give a glimpse of what quote unquote really happened. And so this is from Spencer Fernando, quote, establishment media shares shortened clip of Chief Allen Adam arrest in attempt to generate rage and divide Canadians. Now, the, let's see, when did this happen here? It was a good couple of days ago now that the original arrest happened. But there's this guy who is a chief of one of the local First Nations here in the prairies, Chief Allen, and he was violently arrested. Not just arrested, not just arrested under pretenses that are really beyond sketchy, but that this arrest was a violent affair. And the cops in question did have a video camera running, recording the whole thing, so that after the fact, citizens of Canada, like myself, and like you, the listener, the watcher, can go and see for yourself what happened. Now, some of the audio isn't great. The camera is a dash cam off of the car, the police car in question, and it only captures the uh, 10 minutes or so that things really got out of hand. Things had been getting to a boiling point before that, and we don't get to see that. We don't get to see the harassment that the cops apparently were visiting upon this chief and his wife. Now, what seems to be not contested here is the wife of the chief seems to have had the license plate of their vehicle was expired. Now that driving with an expired license plate is illegal in Canada, and it is worthy of something like a ticket. I don't think anyone would really disagree that this particular woman driving around with an expired license plate, which happens, sometimes people forget to put the sticker on, or the sticker falls off, or this is an administrative detail. Illegal, worthy of a ticket, unarguably, I would say, but not the sort of thing that people should be beaten up for, and not the sort of thing that people should be arrested for. And what was happening in this video is the cop was not leaving this couple alone and the wife was not basically pulled out of the car and arrested for it. Now, while this is going on, the husband is having issues with this, the husband being the chief of this First Nation. And the husband is defending his wife, basically saying that this cop is going to have a problem if they don't smarten up and that as a strange man rough handling his wife he spoke up and was willing to defend her now as a man as a person who has had girlfriends in my life i can say with crystal clarity that if a man came up to if i had a girlfriend or wife my girlfriend or wife and did the same thing that that cop had done for the same reason personally i would have done exactly the same thing and now that is of course not necessarily a good idea because at that point you're escalating violence with a person who can escalate that violence much further than you can. Nevertheless, it is still something of just part of being a man, just part of being responsible for the safety of another person, which is implicit in relationships. We can, we can argue about who wears the pants and which gender is stronger and all that sort of thing, but if you're in a heterosexual relationship, if you have a wife of your own, that is part of your responsibility as a man, is to keep her safe. And if you are married, I'm sure wedding vows contain things like in safety and in health and blah, 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 right? You are charged with 
providing a safe environment. And again, if a strange man comes and starts harassing you physically and harassing your wife, I would hope those of you out there who have wives that you would do something about it. Now, maybe in this particular case, us mouthing off and speaking violently to a cop isn't going to end well. And we should assume that there is going to be a consequence to that. And maybe it's not a good idea to pick a fight with that particular guy generally, but personally, I would do the same thing. I don't think any conservative worth their salt. Anyone who considers family values to be something worth upholding should be talking down about this chief for standing up for his wife and taking a beating for it, which he did. Because once the cops brought reinforcement, the reinforcement escalated the situation incredibly fast and incredibly violently. And this chief got roughed up for it, at least according to this video. Maybe this video is entirely concocted as with some kind of deep learning magic, but I personally don't think so. I think this is exactly what happened. And I think that the initial video, this attempt at making outrage because there was violence at all, doesn't tell this, the whole story. I think Spencer Fernando is right about that. But I think he's still missing the point. And I think the conservatives generally are missing the point on this one. And on the cops' side, they really should have not escalated the situation as quickly as they did. Yes, the gentleman in question was out of control. And yes, he was willing and able and fully ready to escalate the situation. The cops should be trained to know how to not escalate situations like that. And maybe this time it just got out of control and this is a one-time thing. But of course, we know that isn't true. This sort of thing has been happening all over North America and being documented at a pretty regular clip this week. So there is a question of how do we keep police from escalating like this? But at the same time, while we can understand that particular instance of people willing to escalate, it's still worth thinking about. And especially as I was kind of pointing out before, generally you don't want to escalate with cops because they're going to be able to escalate well beyond your control and there's not going to be much you can do about it. In this particular case, I think the chief did the right thing and he took the righteous beating. It's unfortunate and there should be consequences on both sides for this, but I think he did the right thing. And ideally, the situation shouldn't have gotten that far. If we can avoid escalating on that level, maybe in your life, you, the listener, can avoid getting into a point where you have to step into a fight you're going to lose. I would hope that that is possible in your life. It isn't always possible, but worth thinking about anyway. But that isn't the only conversation worth having this week. It isn't the only thing going on over this past couple of weeks. There is one story from a couple of weeks ago now that I wanted to highlight because this is another example of healthcare providers who are being ignored, who are the ones especially here in Saskatchewan, who are responsible to a large extent of our success in dealing with COVID. And yet they are the voice telling the rest of us that, oh, hey, there's this problem and we should be paying attention to this problem. So, mm, T. So, quote, union renews call for COVID-19 outbreak declaration at Pasco Hospital says staff member shows symptoms. And this is from the uh, SUN Nurses Union website here. Quote, the Saskatchewan Union of Nurses, SUN, says the provincial government is dragging its feet on declaring a COVID-19 outbreak at the Pasqua Hospital after a patient at the facility tested positive for the virus earlier this week. And on Thursday, this is Thursday prior to the May the 15th, so about a month ago now, when the case was announced, a son, President Tracy Zambori, called on the province to declare an outbreak, saying the patient came in close contact with 38 people and on close contact with 34 others. Zambori called again for the outbreak declaration Friday, saying that one of the patient's contacts at Pasqua is now showing symptoms of COVID-19. Zambori said the call has gone unanswered, with provincial officials calling the case an occurrence as opposed to an outbreak. This is turning into a serious matter, and I think we should be acting in a much more swift, much more concise way. And then it kind of goes into the various other factors in play. Quote, as registered nurses, we're not trying to be fear mongers or raise alarms. We're here to hold the system accountable. And the SHA was investigating this. The NDP made comments that they wanted a little bit more consistency on the part of the provincial government and so on and so forth. But the point here is that we have some really low numbers of COVID cases here in Saskatchewan generally, Saskatoon, specifically. Saskatoon's actually like got a little bit of a bump in it the past week or so compared to the rest of the province in a relative way. But the numbers are still really low. And especially compared to what we were expecting, the thousands of cases, we are nowhere near that right now. But it starts to be curious when we hear of instances of the provincial government and the SHA not declaring an outbreak, even when it seems that one was going on at the hospital. In Regina. And it starts to be worth considering whether or not there's political pressure being made on the SHA to, in terms of the data it is giving to the public, and whether or not that has been in some way manipulated for 
uh, political purposes by our provincial government. Maybe the numbers really are that low. Maybe we are at the tail end of the crisis, at least here in Saskatchewan. As the province opens up, we're going to see whether the numbers continue to stay low or not. The province has been opening up this week, this uh, Monday. A lot of stores and bars and restaurants started opening at a limited capacity, but open enough that people can start to have a social life again. And yet we have this question of even the nurses aren't being listened to. Even the nurses' union, their organized body that's as an institution responsible for, for speaking with the voice of the nurses is being ignored when they're saying that something is happening. Was there an outbreak in Pasco Hospital? Are the nurses completely confused? Do they not know what they're talking about? The people who are on the front lines and who see in person when this particular disease spreads? Maybe, but it's worth thinking about. And while we're thinking about things, and while we're talking about things over Facebook, one last thing I wanted to get to as we're running out of time here is this question of how reliable we can expect Facebook itself to be. And it has been interesting seeing things like the Black Lives Matter protests earlier a couple of years ago, the current wave of protests, and other protest movements as they have spread across the politically aligned people of especially North America, and the different level of awareness that people will get depending whether they're really, really engaged on Facebook, Twitter, the Fediverse, or other networks, or just in person, maybe along legacy media like TV and newspaper as well. And Facebook has been different. There have been issues where you can see on Twitter really clearly that something is going on and that there's a protest happening and then you go on Facebook and you see nothing and it's like nothing is even happening and I have experienced that I've seen that before and I don't think it's it's just me on that case I think a lot of people have seen the same thing and so with that in mind let's hear Newsweek this week quote Zuckerberg says Facebook could restrict posts for inciting state violence if U.S. faces prolonged period of civil unrest. Quote, facing widespread criticism, Mark Zuckerberg has defended Facebook's decision not to remove a controversial post by President Trump. However, or he also said, if the U.S. is entering a prolonged period of civil unrest, it may review policies relating to posts about inciting state violence. The social network founder a fueled outrage and rare displays of employee revolt this week after failing to take action against an update from the president on May 29th that included the phrase, quote, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Uh, which, by the way, is a factual statement. It can be seen, of course, as a encouragement for people to shoot each other, but on its own, it's totally true. If you are in an area with people who, like during the Rodney King riots, have stores and don't feel that the police are going to be stepping in, that the crowd and the mob has gotten totally out of hand, one of the things you can expect, especially in the States where people have guns, is things like the quote-unquote rooftop Koreans, which in the case of the Rodney King riots, uh, there were people in the Korean community in the United States who banded together, posted people with guns on top of roofs, and protected their storefronts. This is something we can expect to happen, and there are reports of this happening all over the United States right now. I've heard reports of quote, rooftop Somalis, that in Minnesota, in the riots that have been happening there. Again, whether they're caused by this police inciting a riot or not, irrelevant. There's going to be people in the United States who have access to guns who are going to shoot people trying to loot them. We can expect this. It's something that if you are the type of person who are thinking right now or thinking of, oh man, if the looting starts in my city, I'm going to start, I'm going to join in. Well, one of the risks is going to be you could very well get shot. So think very carefully about that. But anyway, continuing. Protests against police brutality erupted across the U.S. following the killing of George Floyd. 46 who died while being arrested by the police in Minnesota on May 25th. So we're not even like a, a month in. We're like two and a half weeks later and the consequences are still just spiraling away from us here. Quote, unlike Twitter, which has labeled Trump's post as glorifying violence, Facebook left it online, sparking complaints and resignations inside the company. In a video meeting with Facebook staff Tuesday, Zuckerberg said that the ongoing civil unrest in the U.S. could force executives to evolve the platform's policies about what government leaders can post about state violence. Quote, if we were entering a period where the, there may be a prolonged period of civil unrest, then that might suggest we need different policies, even if just temporarily in the United States for some period, compared to where we were before. Pause. So, first of all, those policies are not going to be temporary, by the way. Once you start allowing Facebook to decide who can and cannot speak, who can and cannot say what, who can and cannot incite other people to act, you are going to keep that 
rule on the books. They're going to continue to use it over and over and over again. The people who think that this is new, that people are only inciting violence in the states or that this is in some way specific to the states, this is small scale compared to what's going on in India right now, That, or at least over the past couple of months, that the what it has been compared to Kristallnacht, the sudden explosion of violence along uh, religious and racial lines in parts of India right now is well, well worth considering to be, uh, again, caused or at least furthered by people's actions on social media and the ideologies that have no problem in calling for violence down there. Now, India is only one example. It's one of the bigger ones. But it's worth thinking that like, once you allow Facebook to intervene in a conflict like that, they're going to also be pressured to intervene in the case of India. And who gets to control what side can call for what in that conflict is going to have big, big implications later on. And even just allowing Facebook to have that kind of power, who are they responsive to? Who can pressure them? Who can allow or not allow them to silence a group, to put pressure on who can, again, say things and who can't? Facebook is totally unaccountable to you, the user. It is totally unaccountable to governments, even. If they're talking about censoring and silencing the President of the United States, they can definitely do it to you. They can definitely do it to your group. They can definitely use and concoct a justification for doing it. So it's worth thinking about when they're stepping in on that level, how much power they are assuming over the conversation, the conversation, and all of its little counterpoint rhythms and all of the different branches that are coming and going, all of which are now in their hands with them able to choose what voices are heard and what's not. That's a level of power Facebook shouldn't have. That's a level of power that we should be denying to them, that we should be working together to avoid them being able to exercise. And that is what I'm going to leave you with this week. So if you enjoyed this broadcast and would like to hear more, please consider going to the subscribestar.com slash Jeff dash Cliff. And if you have any Creative Commons or public domain music you'd like me to share with the world or anything you'd like me to talk about or any other guests that you'd like me to engage in this conversation, feel free to leave a comment wherever this video is posted. And with that, I will see you all next week.
We'll see you tomorrow. But in the meanwhile, always remember to be good and so...